1. So this happened in April of this year, 2018. Background. I live in a major city in Texas. My apartment complex is gated and in a good neighborhood, but the security isn't extremely tight. Sometimes the gates are left open and anyone could piggyback off of someone else entering with the access code. Maybe twice in the past three years, the management has put out notices of vehicle break-ins or other items being stolen from porches. We also have frequent door-to-door -door solicitors, even though there are signs forbidding it. Okay, so this particular Friday evening, I go to bed about 2.30 a.m. For some odd reason, I was having trouble getting to sleep, so I put on a podcast to listen to, and eventually start to doze off. I become aware of a noise that sounds like a clicking sound, but it sounds like one of my upstairs neighbors making some noise. I kind of zone this out, as I am used to my neighbors staying up late on weekends. After about 30 seconds, I realize the noise is extremely repetitive, and getting louder. I then start focusing on it more intently, trying to isolate what it could be, and where it is coming from. Suddenly it hits me. It's coming from the entrance to my apartment. I leap out of bed and head to the foyer. I identify the noise right away, the lock mechanism is moving back and forth rapidly. Like someone is trying to unlock the front door. I can hear that an object is inserted in the lock, and the person is jimmying it back and forth with a lot of force. I instinctively turn around, head to my bedside safe, unlock with the combination, pull out my 357 SIG pistol, load a 14 round magazine, and chamber a hollow point round. I head back to the door, and as I exit the bedroom, I see the lock twist and unlatch. I immediately point my weapon straight ahead, knowing that if someone comes through, I will have to make a split-second reaction. I decide that if someone comes through the door, I will give them a momentary chance to retreat. But if they do anything other than that, or enter aggressively, I'm going to shoot and ask questions later. They don't enter, however, because I had also locked the deadbolt inside only. When I first moved in a year prior, I remember thinking that the deadbolt was a great security feature, and I got in the habit of always keeping it locked when I'm home. In hindsight, this decision saved me from a life or death situation. Upon realizing that, I approach the door and look through the keyhole. On the other side are three Asians, two men and one woman. All three were wearing hoodies, so it's difficult to make out their faces. The men have objects in their hands, but I can't make out exactly what. The two men are talking back and forth, probably trying to figure out why they can't open the door, even though they have successfully opened the outside lock at this point. The woman is also talking loudly behind the two men, such that anyone in the hallway would be able to hear her voice. She is talking in another language. The only words I can make out are blah blah blah, apartment 250, blah blah blah. And she keeps repeating that over and over like a broken record. Upon hearing that, I start to wonder for a moment if maybe they're just drunk or have the wrong apartment number, but that's impossible. To open my lock, they would have to have a copy of my exact key or some kind of lock-picking device. I have never copied my key or given it to anyone. Here's the other thing. Not only is 250 not my apartment number, but as I figured out later, that apartment number doesn't exist anywhere in the complex. Standing back from the door, I take a long broom handle and jab it hard into the face of the door, letting them know that I'm on the other side. They immediately stop fiddling with the lock and take off running. I debate whether to call 911 and decide against it unless they return. I know they'll be long gone by the time anyone gets here. It would be too risky to follow them and try to get a better description or license plate and I don't have enough identifying info as it is to make an arrest. I filed the police report the next day and let the apartment manager know. They said it was unusual, but they would alert the resource officer and ask for a police presence for a couple of nights. Nothing ever came of the report, but that's not a surprise to me. It's been seven months since this happened, and no further incidents. Nobody else in the apartment has reported anything similar happening. I don't think they'll be back, but one precaution I took was to buy a smart lock for the deadbolt. So I can leave the deadbolt always locked from the inside, 
even when I'm not home. It's crazy to think that the deadbolt was the only thing between myself and an armed confrontation with intruders. They say you don't really know what you'll do in those situations until it really happens. But I can honestly say I'm proud of how I stayed calm and was mentally prepared to defend myself. If there's one good thing that came out of this, I feel confident that I responded the right way and was ready for the unthinkable. So, 3am burglars and your female accomplice, let's not meet again. And for your own sake, please find a safer way to make a living. There is nothing in my apartment worth dying for. 2. So at my first job, I had a co-worker named Jai who lived in India. And I live in the US. In the beginning, I didn't know anything about him, except that he's really good at his job. And in the future, I'll be working with him a lot after I finish my training. We outsource half of our team to India, so it was normal to interact with him on a daily basis. Since we were a huge corporation, our jobs are high in demand. And we have a rotating on-call schedule. Almost a year into my job, sometime in 2015, Jai was supposed to visit the US on a work visa for about six months. During those six months, I didn't really talk to him much. He seemed really shy. I didn't really think much about it. Around that six month time period, my boyfriend proposed to me and I said yes. The entire team congratulated me, including him. Then it was time for him to go. I wished him goodbye didn't really give him much attention or even remember much of my interactions with him. Fast forward to three to four months later, sometime in early 2016. I finally was assigned a project and Jai was the project lead. I messaged him a few times, asking him a few questions, and he always answered my emails or messages fairly quickly. I appreciated his help and told him that multiple times. So one weekend night I was assigned to launch one of his codes. Since it took a long time and it was a quiet night, we decided to chat over I am. He seemed like a pretty cool guy, actually. We talked about the differences in US and India culture. We talked about mine and his college days, sports, politics, etc. I thought he was chill and daily we would I am each other about work and non-work related stuff. Since he knew I was engaged, I told him about wedding preparations. Stuff about my fiancé, mine and my fiancé's family, my bridesmaids, etc. We gradually moved to texting every now and then. It got to a point where he knew quite a few things about me, and I didn't see any problem with it. Soon Jai started doing things that I didn't find alarming at first. If I was busy and I didn't answer his messages, he sent multiple messages at a time until I answered. He asked a lot of questions about my personal life, habits, family members and friends. It did bother me a bit, but didn't think it was that big of a deal. It got worse later. I was close to another guy co-worker named Raj. Jai would sometimes talk shit about Raj. But I found out later that Jai was jealous of Raj because Raj and I were really close. Jai later on revealed to me that when he visited the US and met me, he was so intrigued that sometimes he used to follow me around. During lunch hours, I used to go out with some other co-workers and apparently he'd see me outside and follow me. He thought this was normal. This was stalking pretty much. I was really creeped out. I soon stopped answering most of his texts and was extremely short with him. Jai got really desperate and later on confessed his feelings for me and told me to marry him instead and how he'd treat me better than my future husband ever will. My fiancé and I were long distance during our engagement, but I eventually visited him and told him everything that happened. My fiancé was obviously pissed, but I told him I'll handle it. I told Jai to forget about any idea of him and me ever being together. Jai wanted to fix things so badly, so this is what he did. Jai decided to fly to the US a month before my wedding to pretty much convince me to call off the wedding. My boss and Jai are extremely close, so Jai made some good-ass excuses on why he should be in the US for some projects. My boss agreed, and here Jai was. Oh my god, things were so awkward after that. Remember Raj? Apparently Jai gave Raj hell for being my friend. He berated me and Raj for being too close and pretty much accused me of having an affair with Raj. He followed me all the time, tracking my I am status, texting me constantly, begging me to give him chances. 
It got to the point where I yelled at him a few times to leave me alone. He would do things like grab my hand and arms while I was talking to him, and I started threatening him that I would report him if he did anything more. Eventually he got the message, but didn't mean he left me alone. He started writing emails to me about all the mistakes I've been doing in my projects and would CC my team. My boss didn't really have my support because Jai and he were really close. Raj confided that Jai would still disparage him during meetings, pretty much making his life hell. I finally got married and Jai congratulated me, but still would try to message me in hopes that I would be friends with him again. I couldn't take it anymore and decided to report everything he did to HR. My HR rep didn't exactly make this process easy for me. Lots of times when I told her the story, she turned it around and told me that I encouraged him to harass me by acting a certain way, or allowing him to text me or being friendly to him outside work. I decided to quit the company and move to another job. At times Jai would try to hit me up, but I started blocking him. He tried Google Hangouts, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. I started blocking him on all social platforms. I blocked him on everything and hope he never tries to contact me again. So Jai, let's not meet. 3. As most teenagers, I was pretty reckless with my own safety. I knew about kidnapping and murder and such, but thought I was invincible and doubted anything would ever happen to me. At the same time, I was quite receptive, paranoid, and aware of my surroundings, just not educated enough. Being this naive comes with its fair share of dangerous situations. From ages 12 to 17, I preferred to go out in the dark, it felt more exciting. I'd frequently go out for long walks with my best friend who was a year younger than me. And if I wasn't with her, I'd tell my mom I was so she wouldn't worry. We never really had specific destinations, just loved to walk, and at the later stages, despite my previous experiences, walk town to town, frequenting particular benches and particular deserted places. Stupid. This experience I shared with my friend when I was around 14 or 15, and her 13. One of our regular daytime spots was a well-known area of my town, hard to miss. Huge chalk hills and woods with miles of field and farm. A very strange sight amongst the businesses, homes, council estates, miles of roads and shopping centres it surrounded. As you can imagine, a beautifully quiet place to visit to get away from the rush and mounds of other humans, and instead watch it from afar. It tended to be only dog walkers and the occasional jogger that frequented these areas, and apart from teenage parties, which were few and far between in this area of the hills, I'd never heard of much crime happening there. One evening we walked to a park we liked to chill in. I cringe thinking about this place too. It was huge and fenced in behind lines of houses and was locked at a certain time each night. It was the most remote and lesser known park in the area that had many of similar size. Mostly due to being hard to find, and it held an even lesser known at the time passage to the hills. We hung around in the park for a bit, in the darkness of winter, got bored, and decided we'd go for a stroll across the fields. Maybe even try to get into our little den we had built there one summer. For some much desired adrenaline. From past experiences going with groups, there was rarely ever people there after dark. Probably because it wasn't very well lit. We took the path and joked around on the field under the hills, wandering around when we noticed a short, stocky man with a limp in the distance. I instantly got a weird feeling about him, and it wasn't my usual fight-or-flight anxiety I got with your regular human. It was pure get-your-little-arse-down-that-path-and-to-somewhere-safe anxiety. He seemed to stop and turn around and walk a bit, and then turn back towards us and walk a bit closer, then change his mind over and over, and then he stopped again and turned towards us, as if on a mission headed in our direction. We headed straight for the path. We started slow, nervously giggling, and looked behind ourselves, and realized this man was really gaining despite his limp. It just didn't feel right, so at this point we ran. We ran through the unlit park, which at this point had multitudes of bats flying across, just to add to the allure, and looked behind us. He was still following. When we were at the gate exiting, he was just starting to cross the grass. 
Now this wasn't the only way to the main road, it was muddy and dark and occasionally locked. But in our worry I don't even think that crossed our minds. Looking back, most rational thinking adults probably wouldn't go this way behind two little girls. They'd follow the pathway that went around the outside instead. We went this way because to us it seemed the quickest and, already in an unsafe situation, it didn't seem as dangerous as this stranger catching up. We ran down the road, crossed the traffic lights, and slowed down. We were next to a pub, so we felt safe. In the light of the pub, we rationalized it. I mean, it could be a coincidence, and he could just be walking in the same direction as us. But all the same, we still wanted to get home without him knowing where we lived, so we continued forward at a fair pace. Again, looking back as we walked, this man was still staggering after us, and he looked tired. Why didn't he slow down or stop? It just didn't add up. We were down a dark, empty road, and were unnerved once again. It was about three quarters of a mile until we got to some 24-hour shops, so we decided we would run it. The sooner we were around other people, the better. We just about made it to a shop, hid behind a passport photo machine, and looked towards the road where we left the man behind. In these few seconds, I felt rational again, and imagined he'd just continue his rushed walk all the way to his home, but instead he stopped at the crossing and inspected the roads. He was looking for us every which way he could, really searching for something, and it most certainly wasn't for a car. He decided on a street, and as fast as his dodgy leg could take him, attempted to trail after us. Me and my mate were shaken. We couldn't understand why he was following us, but we knew that he almost certainly was. After a couple of minutes, we decided to try and confirm what was happening, and peeked down the road he went on. We could see him clearly annoyed looking down each side road and turning in circles desperately looking for a sign of where we went. We left him there and hurried home in the opposite direction, only taking the main roads now. The next day at school, we told the story to our friends at lunchtime, and everyone agreed it was weird. He must have followed us about one and a half miles in the end, which is a fair distance. Just for comical value, although reasonably irrelevant, a lad that just as lunch ended, a janitor with a strikingly similar limp and the same broad body type walked into the cafeteria. Myself and my friends just looked at each other and for a short while convinced ourselves it was him. We still talk about it now and wonder what his intentions were. I wonder more about what he would have done had he caught up with us at the shops or pub. I most likely now think that he was just trying to scare us either because that made him feel something or because he wanted us to not endanger ourselves like that again. But I think that might just be my naivete shining through. I can't say I was a lot more careful after that experience, but I'm glad to still be here and much more educated and aware now. All I can say is I never went back to the hills after dark again, and I wouldn't recommend it either. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 349. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Well, it's apparently Cyber Monday as I record this. Apparently that's a thing. Uh, didn't buy anything during Black Friday because all the deals were rubbish. Well, actually, no, that's not true. I did get a couple of games, uh, but... You know, they put things on sale on Steam all the time, so that doesn't really count. What did I get? Oh yeah, I got Megaton Rainfall, because I wanted to feel like Superman. More than I already do, obviously. And uh, I think I got there was some kind of cowboy game I'd played a while ago that I never actually finished. That I had on the Vive port subscription, because when you get the... Um, Depending on when you buy it, uh, like when I got it, there was a two-month uh, free, I'm using air quotes here, free subscription to the Viveport thing, which really isn't a very good service in my own experience. I didn't enjoy it. Didn't think they had a lot of choice. And uh, this one, it was, a, it was a Guns and Ammo or something. Um, something stories. You play this kind of old grandfather, and he's telling stories to his grandson and heavily exaggerating his days as a gunslinger in the Old West. Uh, ludicrous, and it actually gets more ludicrous as you play through each level, 
Like you might find you have like a ridiculously implausibly large gun just because the old fella's you know he's gonna try to impress his grandson. Uh, so I got that because I never actually completed it when I had it on the Vive port thing. So now I actually own it. So that's good. Okay, and with that, I think I'm gonna head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.